September meeting of the Houston County Historical Society. I'm Deborah Stanfield, president of the society. Um, if you would please be sure to sign in if you haven't already and silence your phones, which I'm about to have to do. Um, Mr. Smithy, would you lead us in the pledge to the flag, please? Thank you, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did all the members receive their minutes, either one way or another? <coughs> Is there a motion to accept the minutes as they are presented? So moved. Second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dan. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? Miss Betty, Treasurer's Report. Mm -hmm. uh, since I wasn't here last month, uh, the balance we had in July was $3,816.80 in the uh, uh, Checking account, our income was $240.71. That was sale of books, interest, and dues. We had expenses of $1,075.08. We paid for the plaques, and we had to pay Friends of the Library for the amount of books that was in that order that St. Louis Library ordered, and a post office box for rent and some uh, pictures and speaker. And our balance now is, in the checking account, is $2,982.43. In our uh, certificate of deposit, eleven thousand forty-eight dollars and twenty-four cents. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the treasurer's report as presented? So moved. Is there a second? second. All in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Okay. Um, Lisa, if you'll give us an update on the archives, please. Uh, my name is Melissa Barker. I'm the Houston County Archivist. We're located in the basement of the courthouse. Um, as I've announced in the past, we've expanded, so please come and see us um, and all of our historical exhibits and displays. Um, we have a special new addition to our archives. Many of you may have seen it in the newspaper. I took a picture and I made a copy. I printed it out if you want to see it. Um, there was a door it said U.S. Post Office here in Tennessee that was located in an antique store in Dixon. And so there was an anonymous donor that purchased the door and brought it back to where it belongs to Houston County. Um, we were a little bit, didn't know if it was authentic uh, because of where it came from, but Mr. Shimmy Coakley came down to the archives yesterday morning. Um, and when he came in, he found me and he said, uh, I want to look at that door. I said, okay. I said, do you want to, he had his cane. He was walking fine. I said, you want to take the stairs or the elevator? He says, well, the stairs, of course. So he took the stairs up and back down and back up. He says, I'm slow, but I get, I make it. So, but he looked at the door and he says, yep, that's the door I remember from the 1940s. And then Miss um, Jackie Largent Smith also came, looked at the door. It was kind of interesting. All the one day, everybody kept coming and looking at the door, which was wonderful. But uh, she said, too, that's the door. Um, and Jim Bauer called and said. So, and they, everyone says that it's the, it wasn't the front door, but it was the door on the back side, not the back door, I've been told. It was like a caddy corner door on the back side of what Bell's is, mm -hmm. where the post office was years and years ago. Yes, Miss Betty? It was a side door. A side and, door. And door okay. is, a door is still in that position, because I remember when Bill Smith used to meet the train and bring the mail, and that's the door he had to go in. Okay. So we were very, very, very excited to have it authenticated. So uh, it's in the archives, and it is a, the whole door. So we were very excited to have it. And another update on the archives is um, Leah Baggett is still working on the school registers. They date from 1922 to 1985. And where are you at? In, in 45, uh, 45, 46. 45, 46. And these school registers were get, uh, transferred to us from the school board. Uh, they include all the little schoolhouses that we had in Houston County from 1922, which, I mean, includes all the little communities that are not even in existence that much today. And um, 
but we have had some interesting finds in them, and Leah's had a lot of fun. She's doing an index of them, so we know what we have. Um, but you're also welcome to come, and if you graduated or was in elementary, especially if you were in elementary school, because there's not very many high school ones. But they're all from elementary schools. Mm -hmm. If you went to elementary school in Arlington, or what are some of the other ones? Campground, Aaron, Silvertop, Spring Hill, Spring Valley, Pollard, Tennessee Ridge, Stewart, there's a lot. And there's only one, <clears throat> there was ninth and 10th grade at Stewart. That was the only thing after eighth grade. There was only one school at, after eighth grade. So we have those in the archive, so, and they are, you know, they're not uh, cataloged, but they're uh, boxed by year, so we can find whatever year you'd like to look at. Um, and lastly, uh, I'm doing this for Angie, uh, Angie Nielsen. This is a new City of Erin travel guide. <laughs> Angie, can you tell us about it? Well, the City got a grant. It began actually as a technical grant from the Chamber to do the photographs. And then that technical grant, I was able to leverage that to get a brochure to depict small businesses in town. And then I used that to leverage against a different grant to do something different. And so this pictures are sort of the leftovers from that grant and some that I took myself and the information that's in that booklet actually was Mr. Bob McKinnon's information. So I wasn't able to use any photographs of his but that's his information and so we're just very proud and we dedicated that to Mr. Bob. And it's I've looked at it it's beautiful we even have the archives it has a little section here at the bottom so that's great and they're over there so if you want to pick you up one before you leave uh, you can do that. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, new business, Jerry said he would like to present something to you. As I stated last month, but for y'all who don't know me, I'm Jerry Bobby. I'm Vice President of the Historic Society. I was doing a project of finding pictures from Danville that TVA had took before the flooding and during the flooding of uh, the Danville town in Kentucky Lake. And uh, the National Archives received half a million pictures from TVA and they were dedicated to them. Well, they're negatives is what they are. So I contacted them and I got an agreement that I could order 20. And I ordered 20 and I got a book of the 20 pictures that we ordered from Danville. And they're different pictures that I've never seen some of them before. Some of them are similar to what we have, but I've never seen a lot of them before. And uh, I'm going to put this book up here on Miss Betty's desk. We're, we're trying to come up with a project to raise some more money so we can order some more pictures. I've uh, looked online. I, the, first, the lady, the, the, the archivist, she said she had 164 pictures of the Danville area. And this is what I picked a 20 out of. Well, since then, I've done some research myself that she sent me the link and I probably found another 50. So there's over 200 pictures of the Danville, Aaron, Sturt, McKinnon areas of, of pictures that they have. The problem is, is they charge us $2.50 a piece to scan these because they had to cool it down, cool the negatives down for a day, take them and then they scan them. Now, if we go down there and scan them with their equipment, they're a quarter a piece. If we take our own equipment down there and scan them, they're free. But they're in Atlanta, Georgia is the main problem there. So is anybody heading to Atlanta in the next? <laughs> We're more than a little welcome to uh, have you down there scanning a bunch of pictures, but you got to let them know so they can get the boxes out and cool them down or warm them up before. But we had an idea that maybe we could take some orders on these pictures if anybody would be interested. And the orders that we take, we was going to charge like $5 a piece, and then we was going to order some more because I have a list of the pictures or the, of the pictures that she had sent me and some of them are just the same thing but I think they're from different views but some of them are a whole lot different pictures but we were just trying to figure out a way that you know we could do this where we weren't going to break us is what it was so uh, I'll set these over here Miss Betty's and then if anybody wants to look at them I got an order book here we can take orders on them or if anybody has an idea of how we can go down and get them scanned that would work too. Thank you. We got an election coming up, and people that are running for office, they're always good about 
pain that you're making contributions to good causes. You know, there might even be one here today. Are you running there? Been there, done that. Are you going to present these at the Danville reunion? Yes, I was going to do the same sales pitch. I hate to do this, but I'd like to get more pictures. That's my whole goal. I mean, and I don't want to bankrupt the historic society by doing it. Once I do it, the pictures are going to be public. Um, and the archive says they have no problem with us distributing them, or as long as we give credit to them, which we are. And like I say, <coughs> yeah, you know, there'll be a digital copy in the archives too. And okay. we printed these out, and they were like 29 cents a piece to print out. And you need to go to Walgreens when yeah. they have them cheap. Somebody said when they have a sale, they're 10 cents a piece. If you will get 100 of them, so that's what we're going to look for. Okay. And that Danville reunion uh, will be Saturday morning, October the 5th at 9 a.m., as mentioned in your minutes. Our October meeting for the Historical Society is October the 8th. Maybe Jerry can put a program together that he gave to the uh, Danville people and uh, use him as our speaker in October. Is there any other new business? Old business. Last month, before the meeting, some of us got together and started to discuss the sesquicentennial 150th anniversary of the county formation of Houston County. January the 21st, 1871. Give or take a few days. Several ideas have been thrown out. The Chamber of Commerce and a lot of the community uh, clubs is also interested. I think what we may do for the Historical Society is for the year 2021, is for each of our meetings in that year to be about maybe the education, the iron furnaces or the lime kilns or the agriculture. So each meeting would have a speaker that would be um, most educated in whatever topic that we come up with. If anybody else has any ideas or wants to be a speaker, that would be great. Our speaker tonight is Judge David D. Wolf, 1970 graduate of Houston County High School. It says in your bio here that uh, Judge Wolf was elected circuit court judge in 2014 after 35 years of private practice. His education stems from David Lipscomb College, 1974, and University of Houston College of Law, 1978. Judge Wolf is a member of the State Bar of Texas and the State Bar of Tennessee. He and his wife are currently located at, um, in the Dixon County community. Uh, he's currently located in the Dixon County Courthouse Annex in Charlotte. He is circuit court judge for the counties of Cheatham, Dixon, Houston, Humphreys, and Stewart. And his topic today is about his family military history from way back until his father. And uh, good night. Take over, mm -hmm. Judge Wolf. <clears throat> Um, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. I'm uh, gratified to come back to my home county anytime I'm able to do it, and I have to get my glasses out. So that's one of the signs that I graduated in 1970, and I have to wear glasses now. Uh, the topic that, that uh, about our family's military history is going to be focused mainly on my father, who fought during World War II. Um, the other part of that is because I've spoken in the past about one of our distant ancestors, an ancestor named Philip Wolf, who was a, uh, immigrated from Germany in the 1700s and then uh, fought, we was given a land grant by King George in North Carolina, but then he ended up uh, fighting for the revolutionary forces during the Revolutionary War at the Battle of Kings Mountain um, and was wounded at the Battle of Kings Mountain and then retired back to his home in North Carolina, did not fight any further after that. But his family, ironically, spelled their name without the E, uh, W-O-L-F is how they spelled it, until a generation or two later when they immigrated over in this direction, they added the E on the last name. But they immigrated, some of the 
his children immigrated to uh, Houston or Hardin County, Tennessee, and I may misspeak Houston and Hardin, but Hardin County, Tennessee, down Savannah's way is where my family all is from on both sides. My father's uh, family immigrated there in the 1700s, and then they have uh, been there ever since until my dad moved us here in 1963 after we had traveled around. Um, so our ancestry regarding the military service is there. I haven't done an extensive uh, searching about other ancestors who may have fought in other types of, of battle. Um, and frankly, this is a picture of my father. Uh, my father was born in June of, uh, June 11th, in fact, of, of uh, 1922 in Hardin County. His parents were Will and Cecil Alexander Will. Um, they had seven children. My father was one of those seven children, obviously. And they uh, lived on a very simple life on a farm down there. My grandfather was a, a blacksmith. My dad um, essentially went to school until the eighth grade when his father cut his hands so badly that he couldn't work. So my dad dropped out of school in the eighth grade and worked on the farm and, and helped in the blacksmith until um, 1942. And in 1942, at age 20, this is how he looked. Um, in uh, <clears throat> September the 24th of 1942, my dad was inducted into the United States Army. Um, dad, as far as I know, is one of the very first pictures of him. I don't know if how many of you knew him. Uh, he didn't really look like that much in my life, but uh, there are pictures of him when we were very young where he was pretty close to that. He went through his basic training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi uh, as a part of the uh, 31st Infantry Division Combat Recon Group, which is the picture that I brought here. And I have taken a, a, a dry eraser mark and pointed, uh, drawn a little arrow to him in that picture so that you could see it. Uh, hopefully it will come off after I finish with this talk. But in any event, that we learned from experience that my wife did that on something and used a permanent marker, so we had a little bit of a trouble. But he went through basic training in this 31st Infantry Division Combat Recon, and he was qualified as a, a light machine gun expert. He uh, essentially spent a year training um, with this unit and uh, apparently ran afoul of the commanding officer somewhere along the way. The captain that was uh, immediately over him uh, apparently didn't care much for my father and a couple of his friends. My father was assigned as a cook at that point in time, and he did not like being a cook, although in later years he certainly used his experience in the war as a cook to tell my mother all the things she was doing wrong in cooking <laughs> at the home. Uh, my mother, if any of you knew her, was a pretty fair cook herself, so she didn't take kindly to his telling her how to cook. But in any event, um, this captain came to him one day and was exasperated with something that was going on. And my dad says, he told him, he said, well, you boys don't like it here. Why don't you just transfer it out and I'll help you move to another unit. So my dad said, all right, we'll do it. We took, we took him up on it. So they transferred him to the 512th Military Police Battalion. And that is what we call military police or MPs is how he spent the rest of his career in the Army. Uh, he was attached to Company A, 512th Military Police Battalion, and uh, that was attached to the 3rd Army. Uh, did any of you have family that fought in World War II that were a part of the 3rd Army? The 3rd Army uh, was a little bit unusual. The 3rd Army was founded November the 15th, 1918, three days after the armistice was signed that ended World War I. And it was the occupation army that occurred in the uh, in the United, in Europe during that time. I have a photograph on my phone, if I can get it up quickly, that shows you the insignia of the Third Army. Um, and the reason for doing that is that's, that's the shoulder lapel for the Third Army. I couldn't get it onto a thing where I, I didn't know enough about the technology to get it to where it could be on the big screen, so you're looking at it on my phone. But it's, if you see it, it is a, a white A surrounded on a field of blue, surrounded by a red O. That symbolizes the army is the A, and the red is the occupation. They were the army of the occupation. After World War I ended, the Third Army became the army of occupation for Europe, and they had occupied Germany at that time until they were called home shortly after. Then they became uh, essentially a domesticated army without any wars to fight, so they trained a lot. And, uh, as they trained, they went through different commanders. One of the most notable was uh, uh, General Kruger, Walter Kruger, who uh, in the 1930s and early 40s trained them to become one of the best uh, armies that the Army had at that point in time. 
they <clears throat> essentially divided after World War I the United States into four quadrants. And uh, they had a first army, second army, third army, and fourth army. And the third army was assigned to the southeastern United States. That's why when my father entered into the military service, he was sent to Cap Shelby. That's the area that the third army signed, uh, uh, was assigned to train at. In any event, uh, as they neared their uh, uh, finishing of their training, they were sent to Camden, New Jersey. And it was December the 31st, 1943, that uh, the Third Army changed from an army that was in training to an army that was about to go overseas. And that, anyone know who was designated, some of you may because I've talked to you about it, but the person that was designated to take over the Third Army was General George Patton. Uh, Patton had come from the uh, war in Africa, had had great success against General Rommel down there, and as a result, when they were about to invade Europe, they needed experienced military commanders. So they gave General Patton the command of the Third Army, and the Third Army became a mechanized, uh, I wouldn't say cavalry, but they were a mechanized force that relied on speed and uh, transport to accomplish what they wanted to do. And as a result of that, uh, some of us who grew up around my father, who might have known my father, kind of came to believe that maybe he inherited or acquired some of General Patton's uh, parenting style, <laughs> at least those of us who might have gotten on the wrong side of him at least felt that way. So when it came time uh, to transport the troops over, they were transferred to Camden, New Jersey, and from Camden, New Jersey, they boarded a ship to uh, go across the Atlantic Ocean to England. That ship was the Queen Mary. Anybody heard of the Queen Mary? The Queen Mary was used in, during World War II as a transport ship. Does anyone know why they were using the Queen Mary as a transport ship, aside from the fact that it could hold 15,000 soldiers at one time? The main reason was is they painted it, they stripped it down, they painted it gray, they called it the Gray Ghost, and they painted it gray and used it as a transport because of the fact that it could achieve 30 knots at sea which made it very difficult for a German U-boat, which were preying on troop uh, transports at the time, to keep up and be able to, to attack a ship that it was that fast. So the, uh, Queen Mary was how they transported a lot of the troops. There were other, the Queen Elizabeth was another ship that they did the same thing with. And they transported those troops that way. My dad, as an MP, was required to stand watch on deck. <clears throat> now, you've got a kid from Hardin County, Tennessee, who had never seen an ocean, and they put him on the deck of a, uh, the Queen Mary, uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and tell him to watch out for U-boats and that was essentially what he had. And it all went well except in some of these pictures I've, I've brought only two pictures that I had framed of him and you notice that they're all wearing their life preservers which is a smart thing but he was required to be on deck and during a storm <clears throat> one night he, tells, he told my brother Larry and I that he had to lay down on the deck and wrap his arms behind him around a pipe and that's how he endured that storm, was holding on to that pipe behind him to keep from being washed overboard or at least tossed around. And the next morning he was so seasick when somebody brought him a cup of tea to try to help him calm his stomach, he threw it up and then threw the tea at the person that brought it. <laughs> uh, that was my dad. I, I want to take a moment to say this for those of you um, who knew my brother Larry. Larry helped me a great deal and I meant to acknowledge this at the outset. Uh, my brother Larry uh, wasn't able to be here today, but he helped us a great deal in getting the information. Uh, he sent me the photographs that I'm going to show you in a few moments, um, and uh, those are some that my dad brought back from the war. And he also interviewed my father um, about five years, I think, before he passed away, sat him down and, and made him talk about the war and the war experiences. So a lot of the information I'm giving you today came from, from that. So my dad was a military policeman when they arrived in Europe. Um, they arrived at night so as a, and offloaded at night so the German air attacks could not see them well enough to attack the boat. And they stayed in England and they, trans they um, trained in England for quite a while and then went to Normandy. <coughs> uh, they went ashore in Normandy, but they were there a few days after D-Day. They did not go on D-Day. But they were there at the time that after the American forces had broken out at St. Lo, France, if you've ever heard of that. The American army broke, uh, broke out in St. Lo, and they were able to then start moving eastward towards the German, toward Germany and trying to drive the Germans uh, east back into their own country. General Patton had one general order, and that was, and I'm quoting, seek out the enemy, trap him, and destroy. And that was the way he ran the Third Army. The Third Army was an army on wheels. It was a mechanized unit that relied on speed 
and had thousands of trucks driven by soldiers with supplies, ammunition, and other soldiers. They had tanks, they had military type of uh, half tracks and things, but they were on the road almost uh, constantly. How do you keep that going? You use military police officers. They would have to then direct traffic. They have to keep the intersections open. When you have a gap in between units and you're in a foreign land and you don't know which way this road turns or where the intersection is, you have to have someone who knows the direction to send those troops in that direction. That was part of my, da my dad's responsibility. As a military policeman, he was essential in directing traffic and guarding intersections. Now, it doesn't sound very dangerous, and he, admits first, he admitted readily he did not see combat on the front lines. But what he did see was shelling and aircraft uh, attacks on the, the towns and all that he was guarding the intersections. As an MP, a police officer, he was required to stand in the center of that intersection and direct the traffic no matter what the weather conditions were, no matter what the uh, attacks were that were going on. As long as there was traffic on the road, his job was to stand in that intersection and direct them the right way. And as a result of that, there were many times when he told us that, that he was standing there and there were artillery shells exploding, not on top of him, but close enough that the shrapnel would rain down on top of him and luckily he was able to wear his hat. He could not leave and seek shelter no matter what until as long as there was traffic coming his direction. When he no longer uh, was, uh, when there was no traffic on the highway, then he could seek shelter. And on one occasion, he did seek shelter during a shelling when there was no traffic. He went into the basement of a house and when he got down there, there were three dead German soldiers. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, his options were to go back out uh, and face the shrapnel or stay down there and, and uh, among the dead German soldiers. He said, they weren't bothering me, so I just stayed down there <laughs> and stayed out of the way. So um, obviously, that was a, a danger, there was some danger involved in that. One of his good friends that he told me about, who was a military police officer that was in an adjacent or nearby intersection doing the same job my dad was, after one of those shellings where he got out in the basement, he came out went to check on his friend and found that his friend had been killed by the shelling that had occurred uh, at that same time. So there was a problem. Patton had his third army attacking Germans to the east and he captured a lot of different towns from the Germans. One of the German towns that he captured, or one of the towns he captured was Metz. And uh, about the time that he was continuing to push east uh, with his offensive, uh, the Germans launched a counteroffensive. That counteroffensive became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I know most of you have heard about that. And at the Battle of the Bulge, <clears throat> the Germans were running roughshod over much of the military until the 101st Airborne, uh, out of Fort Campbell now, but the 101st Airborne uh, was sent into the town of Bastogne, and they held the town of Bastogne against all odds, and without any winter clothing or anything that they needed, they were fighting the Germans and holding that line. So Eisenhower had a meeting of the, of the staff and the brass of the United States Army decided they had to send relief. So they decided that the person to send to relieve Bastogne was none other than General George Patton in the Third Army, who was engaged in an attack to the east. In order to accomplish the relief of Bastogne, uh, Patton uh, and his Third Army did something that was almost unheard of and almost thought that it couldn't be done, and that is he withdrew the entire Third Army from its offensive in the east. He pivoted it 90 degrees north and took off on the road to, uh, to Bastogne to relieve Bastogne. He did that in three days in the middle of winter in some of the worst conditions that you can imagine. Uh, and again, my father as a, as a military police officer was required to guard the intersections, direct the traffic in the middle of the winter standing out. If you knew my father, you knew he hated cold weather. One of the things he'll tell you is, is that he never was as cold as he was in his entire life as he was in the Battle of the Bulge, because he was standing in the middle of an intersection, couldn't leave, couldn't go and hide, and he had put on every item of clothing he had, uh, including however many pairs of socks, however many pairs of underwear, however many pairs of anything he had, he did put it all on, including his rain poncho over his winter coat in order to try to stay warm because he was afraid he was going to feel, uh, freeze to death and standing out there in the middle of that intersection. But they uh, not only had to direct traffic, but the military police officers were also required to watch for German infiltrators. What the Germans were doing, well, they were dressing up some of their English-speaking uh, soldiers, and they were sending them in United States Army's uniforms into 
that area to try to divert traffic of supplies and reinforcements to a different area to try to cause confusion among the United States troops. So the military police officers were required to watch for that sort of thing and to prevent it. And that was part of the... Um, but Patton did eventually relieve Bastogne and the Germans retreated. Uh, that led to uh, thousands of prisoners of war as they retreated. The American forces captured thousands of German soldiers um, and as a part of the duties of a military police officer was to guard the uh, prisoners. Prior to the uh, commencement of hostilities, the pre-war ratio was that one military police officer should guard no more than 10 POWs. During the war, it became one military police officer to 50 or 150 or sometimes 1,500 uh, prisoners. Um, but my dad got along with the German POWs that he co that he, uh, he watched. It may be because he, I don't know that he knew his ancestors came from Germany. Maybe he just was biologically inclined to like the Germans. He thought they were much more polite. In fact, he thought the German people as a whole were nicer than the British by far, who he thought had become so inbred on that little island that they were very rude <laughs> to the American soldiers. <clears throat> He didn't like the French much. He thought they were uppity, and all they ever wanted to talk about was World War I. Um, and, but he liked the Germans because, obviously, since they were defeated, one of the things he told me was that any time you stayed at a German house, you got fresh, clean, starched sheets the next morning. Uh, they changed the sheets daily, and they cooked food and did a, did a great job of being host to the people who had conquered them. Now, you can take that as you will, but he liked the Germans. He learned enough German during the... Uh, time that he was guarding the POWs to be able to, to communicate some with them, and uh, he never had any problems with them. But most of the time, I think that would be because the Germans would far rather be with the American soldiers as a POW than to be with the Russians, who were the other options. If they were going to be captured, it was either the Americans or the Russians, and they, the Russians were brutal, and they were as hard towards the, the German prisoners as the Germans had been towards certain elements of their own. I have a couple of photographs. Uh, Few photographs. Just <clears throat> work again. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do is to show. This is my dad as a military policeman, and uh, his attitude about being cocky is the same later in life as he is in that photograph. <laughs> Um, that's him without his helmet. Uh, I'm sorry, this is as clear as the photographs uh, were they brought back. This is on a troop transport coming home. Some of his friends, to my knowledge, that's my father there on the left. Um, that's him as his young man. And then he traveled through France quite a bit, saw quite a few pictures. But I wanted to get you back to the beginning. Of, these are some of the pictures that he had taken off German soldiers. This is the uh, winter offensive on the Russian front, as far as I can tell. Uh, there's a picture here in a few minutes that, uh, of the Arctic Circle where the German soldiers are. And he took these, these are behind the scenes photographs of German soldiers um, and their artillery. That's in Russia, obviously. That's a troop transport that the, that the Germans had. Their douche, the douche uh, is what it's called, the German, I think, is the, the way that turns out. These are the German soldiers on the uh, attention and the band playing on the right. There's the Arctic Circle where these German soldiers have gotten to in the, in the Russian offensive. <clears throat> and this is another picture of the Germans doing the Nazi salute on that boat that you saw earlier. That is a German officer, and, and that is a group of, it's similar to what you saw in my dad's unit, that's a group of uh, those people that. Uh, were training in the German army. So in any way, um, one of the things my dad loved about uh, the, his experience was that <clears throat> when he was an MP over in Europe, uh, kind of towards the end of hostilities, uh, a P-51 Mustang of the United States Air Army Air Force had a mechanical issue and had to crash, didn't crash land, but it landed near where he was stationed and he uh, was sent out to guard it. How many of you have ever seen a uh, P-51 Mustang? Well, it was it was the really a fast, mobile uh, plane that helped turn the tide of the war in, uh, the, uh, in Europe for the American soldiers. It, they could fight the Luftwaffe uh, with the Messerschmitts that they had with a, a P-51 Mustang. It carried six 50 caliber machine guns, three on each wing. <clears throat> 
So when I sent my dad, who was 20, probably 21 at that time, out to guard this plane to make sure that the Germans and no one tried to uh, sabotage it, the pilot happened to still be there. And so he got, my, he got the pilot to tell him, how do, you, how do you operate this thing? The pilot said, we do this, you flip it, you know, and then you push this button. So anyway, they made the mistake of leaving this 21-year-old country boy in charge of a P-51 Mustang with six 50 caliber machine guns. And when he was through, there was not a shell remaining in that. He fired them all until every, every shell in that plane was gone. And, and he said, you can believe how that would tear the ground up. Down the so, but that was, that was one of his uh, things that when Larry interviewed him, he just laughed about that experience. But perhaps the most memorable and moving experience my father had during the entire war is when the Third Army liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp. That is near uh, Weimar, Germany. It was established in 18, 1937 by the Nazis. And over 240,000 people passed through that concentration camp in the time from 1937 when it, was, uh, when it was established until it was liberated by the American army. Jews, Poles, Slavs, political prisoners, criminals, homosexuals, POWs, and Freemasons were sent to that concentration camp for no other reason being the wrong kind of people. 56,545 deaths were recorded by the Nazis themselves in a journal they kept about the people. They were shot, they were hung, some died in transport. My father, as an MP, when the Third Army uh, came close, <clears throat> well, let me tell you this little quick story, and I, I don't want to run over, but the, the story that I've uh, read about is, is that inside of the camp, there were a couple of, uh, of people who had enough ability that they had acquired a few guns, uh, surreptitiously inside the camp, and one of them had, had constructed a, somewhat of a two-way radio. So when the army got close, the, the Nazis in charge of the Buchenwald concentration camp wanted to move all of the remaining prisoners to another location so they could finish the job and keep the Americans from liberating them. So what they ended up doing, they found out, or the uh, prisoners found out that they were about to be moved, and the one that was the two-way radio started sending a Morse code to the General Patton and the Third Army, please come and help us because they're going to move us and kill us. And they sent it to uh, sent it over and over and over again until finally the United States Third Army said, "This is the Third Army headquarters. We are on our way. Hold on." <clears throat> the uh, shortly after that, they entered into the camp and liberated that camp. But it's not, a, not until the prisoners themselves took what few guns they had and attacked the Germans to keep them from trying to move them any further away. Um, my father went into the camp, and as a result of that, um, he saw some things that are hard to describe. Uh, my brother, Larry, in Chattanooga went to uh, an exhibit they had down there called the Tennessee Holocaust Commission's uh, Living On. It's a portrait of Tennesseans who survived the Holocaust or who were involved in liberation of the Holocaust. And this is a, a copy of that. You may remember that at the, Remig at the uh, Renaissance Center over in um, Dixon, they had a big exhibit where these photographs were exhibited on large boards and they had all of these very compelling stories. <clears throat> my father was in that. Um, my dad was part of that exhibit. After my brother had interviewed him about Buchenwald, he contacted the Tennessee Holocaust Commission. They had my father come up there. He went in, they interviewed him, and then they condensed uh, what he had to say into his page in this journal and on that traveling unit. So I, would, I think the best thing I can do to tell you what he saw is to read his own words for you. The introduction is this, D. Wolf from here in Tennessee. <clears throat> D. Wolf's military police battalion was ordered to Buchenwald a few days after it was liberated in April of 1945. They observed German citizens who were forced to go through the camp. D recalls, it was about two or three miles from the nearby town, and the people were made to walk out and observe. Some cried, some didn't have any feelings. Anyway, they got to see it. D remembers being allowed to walk about freely. When I went in through the gate, I saw on the right a big building with a smokestack that was probably a couple of hundred feet high. When I looked down to my right, I saw corpses laying there stacked up like cordwood. He went into the basement where I opened the furnace door and found partially burned body parts of people still there. He saw survivors in barracks that looked like chicken houses. 
The places where the prisoners were sleeping was about six feet long and 20, 15 to 20 inches high, just big enough for the prisoners to get in and sleep. There wasn't any cover of any kind or anything else, and the only thing they had was that little stall, and that's where they stayed and slept. Dee found it hard to see humans desperate for food and not feed them, but we'd been given orders not to give them anything, so we didn't. Their commanders knew from experience that for dehydrated and starving people, only careful reacclimation to solid food would prevent the in their intestines from bursting. There are people today who deny that the Holocaust took place. Those people call my father and all those <clears throat> other people a liar if they do take that position because he told us about it, he saw it firsthand. Those people are dying off that saw it firsthand, unfortunately, so we have to remember those stories that they told. After that, there was a little bit more of an uh, enjoyable service. The war was winding down. He was sent to Czechoslovakia at one point. Um, he traveled quite a bit throughout uh, Europe. I uh, went to Nice, France, but in Czechoslovakia they had a long parade where they had to, to salute for such a long extended period of time that he said that his arm, he couldn't hold his arm up anymore and salute as they marched by all of these dignitaries. He had to take his other hand to hold his hand up uh, in a salute so that he didn't get in trouble. His unit fought campaigns in Normandy, North, Northern France, the Ardennes Forest, Rhineland, and Central Europe. He received the following citation, the Meritorious Unit Award, the European African Middle Eastern Theater Ribbon with five bronze service stars, the American Theater Ribbon, the Good Conduct Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. He returned to the States on a troop carrier. I think that's where those pictures were taken. They look a little too relaxed to be headed to war. I think they were looking a little happier about going home. And he mustered out on December the 30th, 1945 at Fort Knox, Kentucky. <clears throat> he received $300 as a muster out pay. He never talked much about uh, being in the war when we were uh, younger. Um, I think instead, he spent most of his time worrying about work and trying to avoid cold weather. One of the things that was a lasting impression, he never took any of his five children camping. He said, I camped all I wanted to during World War II and I didn't want to camp again. <clears throat> but, um, at the end, and I'll close with this, at the end when he, uh, and I'm lucky enough to have his honorable discharge and some of the information. At the end of his service, he received the following. D. Wolf, to you who answered the call of your country and served in its armed forces to bring about the total defeat of the enemy, I extend the heartfelt thanks of a grateful nation. As one of the nation's finest, you undertook the most severe task one can be called upon to perform. Because you demonstrated the forthrightness, the fortitude, resourcefulness, and calm judgment necessary to carry out that task, we now look to you for leadership and example in further exalting our country in peace. Signed, Harry S. Truman, President. And <clears throat> I think that those who fought in the war, just like many who fought in other wars that our country has endured, have gone on to become some of the greatest citizens we have. My dad loved Houston County. He didn't always talk about it. He didn't tell his children he loved them very much either, so if that makes you feel any better. But he loved <laughs> Houston County. He was glad that we moved here in 1963 after traveling around, working in long periods of time. Uh, and I told the story at his funeral. Most of you didn't know my dad when he was young, but right after the war, he was seeing things and done things that we can only imagine, the horrors that he saw. <clears throat> and he liked to drown in gin. Um, or anything else you could get a hold of. And he was not a happy drunk when he got uh, He was not a pleasant one. Uh, but the thing is, he changed his ways. And in 1963, he quit drinking and moved to Aaron. And the person that, that we knew growing up became a, got baptized in, in the church here in Aaron, the Church of Christ, became an elder for a period of time, and read the Bible through probably more than anybody I've ever known, at least five or six times when he worked at it, just like he did everything else he worked at. His experiences in the war shaped him just like they do almost anyone who serves, but it made him in some ways a better person for what he's saying. And his strength, uh, I think, that he gathered from being in the war helped to serve all of us as a parent, and hopefully some of that has filtered down to his children and to his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. I appreciate your opportunity. To, I brought a book that was the uh, Battle of the Bulge, a book about that that has stories and so forth. His, his, he was in it. 
And so my brother reminded me of that uh, on the phone last night. <clears throat> so I found the page where the, his little story was going to be, and I'll just get it and show it to you. I picked it up, and it's cut out. <laughs> so someone had cut out, I'm not going to call names of who I think it might be, but someone had cut out his story out of that book, and uh, he, uh, as a result, the book is interesting, and you're more than welcome to look at it if you want to. You're more than welcome to look at the book that I brought. But that concludes my story about my dad's service in World War II. I appreciate your opportunity to honor him by talking about his service, and uh, I am glad that I'm home for this opportunity. So thank you very much. Are there any questions for David? Anyone? We shall adjourn. And feel free to pick up the City of Air and Travel Guide, talk to uh, David, and look at the pictures. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.